Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our June 2023 uh, edition of Schools Forum. Uh, thank you all for attending today. I'll just run through uh, the apologies that we've received. We've had apologies from Councillor Rachel Hood, Sonia Harbin, Karen Lodge and Gemma Morgan. And then um, we have substitutes for some people. So thank you to Andrew Robinson, who is attending for Stephen Dewing. Matthew Ferrier for Wendy James, Michelle Roots for Angelo Goducci, and Peter Collins for Sue Prickett. So thank you all very much for attending today. Uh, I'll just let you know that uh, we have made one um, switch on the agenda to take account of member availability. So after the minutes, we'll be moving on to the early years item. So the next item on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting, which was our meeting on the 20th of April. And if I can take it for matters arising and any um, issues page by page, please. So please shout out if there's anything on page one or two, page three or four. On page five, um, there was uh, information about the fact that Councillor Rachel Hood was going to be meeting or had met with uh, Minister Nick Gibb. Adrian, are you able to give us any update on how that meeting went, please? Yes, certainly, Alison. Um, uh, Rachel um, met with Nick Gibb and several Suffolk M and there has subsequently been some uh, backwards and forwards communication challenging um, the department's methodology for funding um, Suffolk and indeed in the last 48 hours we have had the latest response from the senior finance civil servants at the Department for Education which essentially sets out Suffolk gets this money because this is how our formula works and although that's slightly annoying and I know um, Michael and Sonia if she was here would be sort of shaking their heads at this because that's been the point we've made all the way through. We are at a point where we can really um, go back to them to really press the issue. Our we we accept that the formula generates the money that Suffolk gets. Our challenge from the outset has been that the formula is unfair and we can't see the for the formula. So although it feels like there's been a little bit of ping pong, I think we've got to a, a quite a crucial point about the key issue that Rachel and local MPs um, made in the first instance, that the particularly the inclusion of historic elements mitigates against Suffolk's funding catching up. Indeed, um, on the latest set of figures that the senior civil servants are sent through, actually the gap rather than the gap for Suffolk closing compared to statistical and regional neighbours, it will grow. So it's good that we've had sight of all of their figures, but the challenge continues um, and uh, we'll be drafting with Rachel uh, a, a response to the latest um, letter in from uh, the department and getting back to them fairly sharpishly. You can see that Gordon's got his hand up there. Can we perhaps pick that up later in, in the in the meeting, especially with regard to um, high needs funding? Yes, indeed, that there'll there'll Certainly. be an opportunity for further conversation about it there. Thank you, Gordon. Certainly. Okay, thank you both. Okay, moving back to the minutes, is there anything on page six or seven? Could I please remind you to keep your cameras off if you're not talking? Thank you. Uh, on page six. There was an action for Daniel and Gemma to agree um, where the best place would be to um, discuss the SEND um, Suffolk Education Partnership paper. Um, and as neither are present this morning at the moment, um, we're not quite sure um, what the outcome of that conversation was. So we'll follow that up outside the meeting. Thank you. Oh, I've got a hand up. Andrew. Alison, just to say that Daniel was intending to come. Uh, he's got a trust board meeting, but he is intending to come. So I, it may I guess be I believe he, he's hoping to be here later. So we might be able to pick it up with him again later. Thank you, Andrew. OK, thank you. So that's the minutes. I presume everybody is happy for me to sign those off. Thank you very much.
So moving on now, uh, as I say, we're just switching the agenda around this morning. So I'm going to hand over to Christina to uh, talk to us about the early years funded entitlements and hourly rate changes. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, Alison. Good morning, everybody. Uh, when I issued this paper, that the position as it is in the paper was correct, um, as in we had had no information from the DfE, but I was asking for a decision outside of the meeting so that we could implement the changes in September. However, in the intervening period, I've had some more information from the DfE, which changes that now. Um, so we still don't know what the rates are. They still haven't issued any detail about the funding. But what has what is a big change and a one off change um, is because they recognise that it's too late now for local authorities to go through the, the approvals process to implement um, a, a rise through DSG in September. What the what they are going to do is they're going to when they tell us what the rates are, they're going to issue it as a one off standalone grant that won't go through DSG um, so that we can just go ahead and implement. Um, so my proposal will be that when we know what the funding rates are going to look like, I will consult with the early years provider forum. Um, uh, I'll do a quick consultation with them and they all know that's my, my proposal and they're on standby for when I get, get some information to share with them. Um, and then we will implement in September. Um, and then at the next D DSG, uh, the next schools forum, I will bring an update paper to tell you what we did because in for April, this increase will be included back into DSG um, with any other subsequent increase for April. So I hope that's clear. So I did have a proposal for you to vote on today, but now I don't because the DSG have changed their methodology for distributing that funding. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or queries on that. Thanks for explaining that, Christina. And I know typically you go to that early years group to, to to get a view before you bring a proposal for us to vote on at schools forum anyway so in effect although schools forum are not going to vote on it this time mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the thinking and the the, the decision making and the uh, agreeing what the best way forward is is typically done through your early use group anyway isn't it just That's to clarify right. for new yeah. members mm -hmm. okay yeah thank you does anybody have any questions or comments on that or given that it's a bit of a fait accompli <laughs> Is that and and I'll just I'll just acknowledge on behalf of early years uh, members present that we recognise how tight the funding is for early years anyway. Is there any indication, Christina, about what what, what the level of funding might look like or have you just got no clue? OK, no so you clue don't know how much all. they might have taken inflation into account or anything. Yeah. No, all we're getting is an indicative average amount. But of course, we know Suffolk won't get the average. So I wouldn't want to put a, a proposed figure it. out there because I yes. think it could lead to raised expectations that might not be met. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, thank you. Um, just to say, as I normally do, um, that providers are uh, very grateful for any funding increase. Um, and we do appreciate and acknowledge the proposal that there is a pr principle that um, the maximum amount of money will be passed through to providers. Um, that's that's good for us. Um, and we do appreciate that. Thank you for that comment, Amanda. Yes, uh, uh, you regularly say that. And, uh, you know, as, as Christina put in the paper, and it's worth acknowledging as well, that um, Suffolk, although we're low funded, we, we do passport a very high percentage of the grant through to providers. So um, in, in that way, the, the county is doing its best to help our early years providers. OK, any other comments or questions on that paper? No. Nope. OK, thanks very much, Christina. Thank you. Good luck, everybody, for what the settlement looks like. OK, so moving back to the agenda, um, paper B is the DSG uh, spend paper. Um, so, Mike, over to you. Thank you. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, so Sonia gets a bit fed up, I think, of doing the DSG out turn each year when there's such a large deficit. So she went around holiday. So um, she left it to me to do this year. So this paper sets out the DSG out turn for 22-23. The final position resulted in a 12.1 million overspend against the DSG. So what we'll do, I'll just provide uh, a brief summary and highlight a few points and then happy for any comments 
or questions that anybody has. So if we just go down to table one, this just sets out the um, the various over and under spends in each of the blocks. So as you can see in the central school services block and the historical commitments block, there is a slight underspend. Uh, there was a, a slight overspend on the copyright licenses and an underspend on the regulatory and other statutory duties line. On the early years bit, you'll see this is actually bang on budget, but, but that's because uh, we fund early years in a slightly different way. It's based on actual numbers in each of the January census. So what we do each year is we put in an adjustment to what we think the actual um, recoupment will be. So we actually underspent slightly against the 38.696 million budget. So what we think will happen in July is the DfE will recoup about £86,000 from us. We know sometimes that the numbers that we have compared to the census numbers might be a little bit different, but we're hoping this year we did a, a sort of a thoroughly robust process with Christina and her team. So hopefully there shouldn't be too much difference in that recoupment. Uh, we had um, in, in the schools area, again, we had a, a very slight underspend and that was offset between uh, recruitment and rates. There's always a difference between um, the rates bills that is now paid centrally from our um, from the ESFA. And also we overspent on growth because we had a few more growth cases than we had done in previous years. And then the main bit of the DSG um, overspend is obviously the high needs block. So if we just go down to table two, so this just represents why there's such a, a vast increase in spend in the high needs block. It's been going up for the last five or six years, but you can see especially since 2021, um, we've got a 35% increase in a lot of the placement um, values there that you can see in the first column in 22, 23. So you can see now we've got over 8,000 pupils placed in our specialist provision compared to just below 6,000 a couple of years ago. So massive increases. And then table three just highlights the constituent parts of the high needs block and where the um, over and under spends were. So you can see we've got those pressure areas within top up payments, independent schools and the bespoke budgets. Uh, they're the main ones that the services will be lo looking at to try and um, reduce and mitigate that, that cost moving forward. And I think one of the things that um, that Gemma and her team are finding, especially in, in the independent settings, is that although the increases in placements are going up, an 8% is a, is a big increase still year on year, uh, it's the actual costs that are increasing far more than that. So you can see in, um, I think it's in one of the paragraphs anyway, that there's about a 30% increase in sort of the costs that providers are actually passing on to the local authority now. And that's probably only going to get worse as we move forward. So again, something just to consider um, with a lot of that sort of procurement and, and contract management that we, we're looking at as well as part of the high needs block um, savings plans moving forward. Table four just shows the overall position on our DSG. So um, with the 12.1 million overspend that we reported last year, that brings our overall um, overspend or DSG deficit, should I say, to 27.7 million. Um, not a good position to be in. We're aware of that. Uh, we're obviously on the de Delivering Better Value program where we're looking to, to mitigate and, and bring that down. And in Gemma's paper, that's where we've got that um, the, DS, the DSG deficit management summary, which is a beast of a document. But, you know, that's just trying to show what we're doing um, if we do nothing or if we do some of the sort of the plans that we've got in place regarding the capital program and things like that and how we can mitigate that overspend moving forward. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult, um, but the, the, you know, the service are working really hard to try and to try and bring that down. What we've got on table five is not very detailed at the moment, um, obviously, but we've got the predicted overspend for 23-24. So this was done based on some really early forecasting that Gemma and her team did. Um, and, and at that point in time, it was around 15 million. So in Gemma's paper, I think that figure might be slightly different. And if Gemma was here, that figure might even be even more different because we're nearly three months into this financial year and things change really quickly. Um, but say so we are predicting that £15 million overspend on the high needs block. So that would take our overall DSG deficit up to plus £40 million. Um, although that sounds really bad and it is bad, we're not as bad as some other local authorities. So, you know, it, it gives us a little bit of comfort that we're not the only ones out there and we know that there's people on the safety valve program and there's lots of local authorities on the delivering better value program as well. 
And then um, just to go back to what Alison was mentioning in the minutes and what Adrian just fed back on the the sort of the the ping pong that we're playing with uh, the, the DFE at the moment around our funding. You can see in uh, paragraph 19 that we are still 121st out of 150 local authorities on a per people head on our DSG funding. So we're you know we remain in that sort of bottom quartile of local authorities and we haven't moved out of that. Uh, we always use Norfolk as a good reference point because they're very similar with regards to demographics and they're 105th. And then what we've just done at the end, we've just added in some um, some fairly helpful tables, we think, just regard to our, our funding for um, the Heinies block per pupil. Uh, as Gordon said, I think we'll have a, a conversation about that later on in the um, in the meeting. But as you can see, again, our statistical neighbours, we're down at the bottom on a per pupil basis. And with our regional neighbours, we're down at the bottom as well. So um, it's not a good position to be in. And you know, as Adrian said, what we're trying to do is actually say, this is our funding per pupil. This is Norfolk's. These are our stat and regional neighbours. And you can see there's a difference. What the DfE have said, you know, quite rightly, this is the factual NFF. This is how you're funded, which we can't disagree with. That's right. It's black and white. But what we can see is that, that the difference in funding actually widens each year. We've got the proof, we've got those figures, and it's just trying to get it through to the DfE in such a way that they can understand that and then we can move this conversation forward. Um, and then table seven, the last table, this is just that bit about the historical funding that we're sort of locked into. And again, you can see because we were really good back in 2017, 2017-18 uh, on our um, high needs block spend, we're really low and you know that is a problem. And again, the DfE have said that that should that gap should close as we move into the national funding formula. It will close, but it will take a really long time. So you know that is a really big problem for us. And in the last uh, the last um, paragraph, you can see if we were funded at a similar rate to Norfolk, that would be eight million pounds more for Suffolk, which would go a long way to reducing some of that deficit. And even if we just had the average, that would be an additional three point five million. So um. Yes, we, we, we're doing our best. And um, as Adrian said, we're going back and forth and we'll keep going back until we get the, the right result, hopefully. Thanks for that overview, Mike. That was really helpful. Um, Robert. Sorry, I just turned myself up for a minute. Morning, Alison. Morning, Michael. Morning, Robert. Everybody. Uh, I think you're doing an amazing job with a very difficult hand of cards. I don't know how you do this, really. I'm just wondering, and probably my ignorance, is where this fits into our deficit recovery plan. Because we have one, don't we? So with this, with this big overspend coming, does the deficit recovery plan just keep ticking over regardless? That was my question. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, that that's that's the whole point. So, um, Gemma in the service, um, they are working really difficult, um, really under really difficult circumstances at the moment, as we've said, with increase in in pupil numbers, increase in costs. Uh, so, what we're doing is we've got the the phase two and the phase three of the capital program to try and get um, as many of our pupils into in house provision rather than sending sending them to these bespoke and independent placements, which we know cost a lot of money. So, that's on the cards. And then more recently, um, in the last sort of couple of weeks, the service have been able to get sort of all of the, the pupil information, all of the cost information into one sort of database, if you like. And it's probably the first time that the service have ever managed to get everything into one place. So hopefully we can now work with that moving forward and that should help inform some sort of strategic decision making, which we haven't been able to do as well as we would like to have done in the past. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Dan, if you're not posing a question at the moment, because I ask you to turn your camera off. We're just having cameras on while people are talking. Thanks very much. Uh, Gordon, I'll come to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alison. Thank you, Alison. Um, and the, I mean, the comments I'm going to make, I could make in this paper or the next one. So it's um, it's and um, and the comments are, are not as a uh, a criticism of anybody who's sitting around the table um, at, at the you know, currently. Um, the first of all, the delivering better value program. What do the DfE say uh, about you know, the the level of funding, and which is presumably an integral part 
of uh, a benchmarking um, pro, you know, uh, issues uh, with other authorities. That that's um, uh, part one. On the DFV, yeah, on the safety valve, uh, the 0.5% annual transfer. Well, that's not going to that's not going not to touch anything in the whole scheme of things, is it? Uh, uh, really. Uh, and thirdly, the the funding of the um, high needs, um, you know, is it, still you know is still unfair. It relates to historical spending, which is any sane person would know that you know that that's just uh, uh, not acceptable. Um, you've touched upon um, you know the meeting with Nick Gibb and others, mm -hmm. but really you know what action and what progress have we made? Um, say in the last four uh, four years at a political level, both. Um, at county level and at uh, you know Westminster, um, and you know, you know, are we doing enough? Because the problem is just getting worse. It's it's you know it it's not it's not reducing. Far from it. it it's uh, it's increasing. Okay. okay. Um, one one and three, I think, are sort of similar points, Gordon, that you raised there. Um, you know that that's what we're going. That's what we're going. Yes, yes in. but well, no. Point one is very much you know. Work is being done, you know, as part of a DfE program of better value. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it is at a level where you, you know you, you can raise it. You know, you raise about benchmarking and how, uh, you know, we are, you know, at a school level, we're all encouraged to do um, uh, ben benchmarking. Uh, well, um, it's the same issue here. I can see Alan's put his hand up. Alan, would you like to come in? Yeah, thanks. Um, nice to see you, Gordon. Um, I always assume, assume a good question. The DP fund, DPV funding um, is, I think, quite crude. So basically, everyone who's in the DPV program uh, and we in the first tranche seems to get about a million pounds. Um, we're investing that, particularly in um, school-facing services to help to, to help schools um, be more inclusive. Um, I don't think that's anything like enough to address the issue. Um, you'll have probably seen the Green Paper um, and then the implementation plan in the Green Paper, again, in my view, and Adrian's more expert and others may be more expert than me on it. But again, I don't think that really grasps the problem, which is, um, which I'll come on to talk to about in the paper, the continuing um, huge rise in demand uh, for EHCPs and specialist places. Um, the a bit of a national zeitgeist where special needs means special schools, um, a bit of a lack of faith by parents, not all parents, of course, and not all mainstream schools, but a bit of a lack of faith in mainstream education. <clears throat> you know, the, the, I think I think overall nationally, the, the, the um, deficit on a high needs block is well over half a billion. Um, so it's a huge amount of money and a huge problem that the government um, is going to have, have to deal with. In terms of progress over the last four years, I think that's difficult. I suppose I'm going to talk to Adrian and others about this. It feels, and Rachel, it's a bit like, and obviously you did lots of work in this space, Gordon. It feels like we're wearing away a stone. And we just have to keep on keeping on. Um, sparsity has got a bit better, um, which is good because obviously stuff has got a lot of um, rural schools. Um, and I think we just need to, need to keep on having this argument with the civil servants. I am not, I'm sure the civil servants aren't daft. I know when they write back to us, they must know what they're saying. And they must know, as you know, that using historical spending as a basis for future funding is, you know, neither logical nor sensible nor defensible, really. Um, so I think we just need to keep on wearing away. And that feels like we're getting it. It feels like we've got to think. As you know, and obviously you did this as well, Gordon, engaging MPs. It feels like the MPs are a bit more engaged. Um, in my opinion, probably still not as engaged and active as I would like them to be. Um, but, you know, Rachel continues to push very hard on. I think what might make a difference is if Academy Trusts make more noise about it, because certainly we know that regionally, um, in terms of who Jonathan Duff who seems very good, pays attention to it. He'll pay more attention to the chairs and uh, chief execs of Academy Trust than he will pay to local authority. 
because as far as the DFA are concerned, local authorities and education are kind of rather old fashioned and the future is very much academies uh, and a kind of big academy trust like 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 um, the one you're involved with, Gordon. So that's a bit of a wrap. So hopefully it answers some of your question. Um, if not and I'll by... bring Adrian in as well because Adrian's put his hand up. Thanks, Alison. Um, oh, is my camera come on? Let me just bring that on. Um, yeah, I, thanks, thanks, Alison and Gordon. Thanks for the question. Um, I just wanted to, to to come back on the, you know, what's changed. Well, as Alan said, we are still. Um, in a relentless or on a relentless mission um, and, and and you and I both sat in Nick Gibbs office on more than one occasion um, challenging um, challenging Suffolk's funding I do think we're seeing a slight shift um, in two things small gains but 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 gains nonetheless the first is we now have insight into all of the DFE's figures not the stuff that they share publicly and that allows us to ask some further questions we've not ever had that before so I think that's a positive step forward I think the other thing that's um, that is helpful to us and certainly in the um, in the most recent communication from the senior civil servants in the finance team at the DFE is and this is, you know, possibly my interpretation. Michael will 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 come in on this as well if he if he agrees or disagrees. Actually, what the DfE are saying to us in the latest, um, there's you know nothing to see here mail uh, letter, is actually they're admitting to it the the, the historic element being in the um, being in the calculus because it makes their life easier so our response is going to be but that's at the cost of the lives of children um, that's at the cost of the life chance of children so it's small gains we we just remain relentless around it I believe that the department's strategy is if they keep saying no you're getting what the formula says is that we'll go away we absolutely haven't gone away and we remain more committed than ever on this and I know Rachel couldn't be here today but she's been tenacious on this and similarly in engaging Suffolk MPs as as Alan says um, that there is some traction and some movement there we just have to not go away on this we have to just keep pushing it I don't know if you want to add anything to that Michael because I know you've been reviewing the, the response to no, no, I, I agree with that completely. And there was um, there was one one bit in the the paper which I think I highlighted to Adrian and Alan at the the end. Um, and it it was a, I think it was sort of an admission that the historical factor isn't right. And it did say that the DfE were looking into that. So it was sort of a an an off cuff comment, but it, there was enough in there to actually see the DfE, you know, are looking at that. So you know, hopefully, if we do just keep chipping away at this stone, then um, you know, we will grind it down. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Andrew, I'll come to you next. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, I just wanted to, to come back on Alan's point about um, trying to mobilise the CEOs. And I wonder whether we need to get a working party together, which includes Sion and SEP with the local authority, with Rachel, to discuss this and discuss how we can support this as a community within Suffolk. That sounds like a valuable suggestion, Andrew. I'll, I'll leave others to come back to you on that. Alan? That sounds like a very good idea indeed, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you. Super. I'll, I'll, we'll have that as an action that um, uh, outside this meeting that that will happen then. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert, is that an old hand or a new one? Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Is there any other points anybody wants to raise, particularly around the outturn paper before we move on? I've just no? got, I've just oh, got one, more, got... one more yeah, yes. one more thing to say. Um, and, and again, it was just something I did uh, mention to Alan and Adrian earlier on in the week, is that I think it would be good as for us as a local authority to actually feed in with other local authorities that potentially are also querying some of the, the national funding formula, because I think as you know, it's a really good idea that Andrew just said about you know getting together, but also a community of local authorities potentially getting together and actually doing what we're doing. You know, it might be that they're doing it separately, but maybe if we do it together, that can make more an imp impact as well. So, 
Uh, I, I know you've mentioned to me separately, Mike, that some of the previous national groups uh, seem to have dissipated. So some impetus yeah, okay. to work with other local authorities would be sensible. Uh, yeah. OK, thank you. Any further points from anyone? Uh, Alan has just put uh, in about the F40. Mike, do you want to give some feedback about how that is at the moment? Yeah, we, I think we discussed this, didn't we, earlier on in the week, Alison? I think it just, it's just it's I don't know for for me it's, it looks like it's sort of slipping off the radar a little bit and Adrian you mentioned the um the worthless group as well didn't you where I think um one of these of the execs has, has now retired so again I think that group sort of slipped off a little bit so um yeah I, I think we need to be sort of maybe getting involved with other local authorities and trying to get these groups sort of back up and and running if we can do that to help then you know that'd be a good thing. And I would assume uh, on the back of what Andrew said that uh, some of the trust members round the table here with any links you've got with others elsewhere in the country in a similar position that that could yeah. all feed in together as well. Yeah, definitely. Gordon, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think the you know, including the trusts, et cetera, uh, is a um, uh, is an excellent idea. And um, um, Although I probably can't speak for Unity, I'm sure um, uh, we will. Um, uh, we would welcome uh, be, being involved. Um, I mean, I think uh, from a personal perspective, I think it's um, it's probably what I expected, but it's extremely um, uh, disappointing. Uh, and um, uh, there have been small gains over the last four years, but actually. Uh, additional uh, um, challenges uh, and send the, the numbers in send uh, and the complexity in send is only going to increase um, uh, you know in the in the in the coming years um, so the challenges is going to be uh, e you know e even greater uh, and we shouldn't forget that uh, those children who currently have sent will actually become adults and so the pressure from a, a country's point of view uh, on social care will become even even greater so we think there's a challenge in that uh, we with young people it's going to be an even bigger challenge uh, when they become uh, adults because they they will start outliving their parents which is a historically hasn't uh, hasn't happened and um, you know, it's uh, you know if we continue, you know if we continue to doing the same thing, we'll get the same results, uh, and maybe at some stage we should perhaps refresh how you know how we you know ad ad address this issue uh, with 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 government. Um, uh, maybe we we'll, we'll have to wait until after the next election, uh, but. Um, you know, I, I think we do need to um, you know, look at how we uh, ad ad address the, the the challenges. Um, things are things are different, and we need to do things differently. So. Yes, and on that point, Gordon, I think it's a good point to move on to our high needs paper, and I'll hand over to Alan to introduce that. Thank you. Right, so I'm afraid you got me as um as Gemma's substitute this morning, um, because Gemma Gemma's unfortunately taken ill, um, uh, so I wasn't able to come here today. So um, the the paper is as the paper says, um, it, it tells you what, what the spend the 2022-23 spending was, um, it was half half a million different from um, predicted. That sounds like quite a lot of money. It's actually less than uh, half of one percent. So, um not too bad in terms of predictions. And then for the 23-24 budget, um, a, a, an, an increase to um, a bit over 15 million in terms of the deficit. Um, the pressures in SEND, as Gordon has just said, and, and no doubt every single uh, head teacher or early years provider on this uh, programme knows the pressures in SEND you know, continue in an upward trend. Uh, we are heading towards, you know, over, we're heading probably to this at this point next year to round about 8,000 DHCPs. Every one of the DHCPs um, requires, obviously, obviously it's a plan uh, that requires maintaining, it requires reviewing, it requires input. Um, and as Gordon says, that will have uh, impact into, into adult years as well. 
and we're working very hard to do it. I don't think anything that Rose and her team are everything that Rose and her team is doing is 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 you know is trying to um support schools and, and caring for and, and educating children with special needs and um putting in place provision where um mainstream schools are not appropriate. Um does slightly me what worry me anecdotally that there there are children ending up in special school who don't or specialist places who really don't need to be there. Um but the, as, as everyone here will know, the, the, the law is very much um, predicated towards um, parents having an EHCP. If they want them in the bar to have an EHCP is very, very low indeed. Um, and 96% of tribunal cases are settled in favour of parents, um, which is strange because that seems an incredibly high it's hard to believe that in over 19 uh, out of 20 cases, local authorities and their partners are getting it wrong. Um, so that would make me think that um, the bar, again, for tribunals is very low. Often that means schools taking children over numbers. Um, and some schools, I know from speaking to Ross, that has been schools doubling their numbers because, um, because a tribunal doesn't care whether a school's Full and there's a very loose interpretation of um, what the efficient education of children looks like. But I'm very happy to ask, ask any questions. There's a lot of detail. It shows what the pressures are in the papers. Um, it says the latest version of DSG deficit recovery plans available as a separate document information. I don't have access to that at the moment, but I'm absolutely sure I can get it out as. Um, it did come out separately, Alan. A, a separate email came out at the end of last week, so members right. here have had it. Yeah. Okay. Well, as Michael says, a beast of a document. Um, I'm not sure how incredibly useful it is, frankly, but it is a beast of a document that requires a lot of effort from Gemma and her team to, to complete. But very happy to answer any questions as, uh, between me and Michael and Adrian as best we can. And if there's any questions we can't answer, we'll take them away and um, send out answers uh, via Teresa and Alison. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alan. I can see that Mike has responded to a question Emma Rose uh, arose in the chat already. Are there any other questions? or comments anybody would like to make about high needs funding. We have discussed this a lot in other meetings as well as touching on it with the last paper. Is there anything else anybody wants to add today? Or do we just want to once again acknowledge the very difficult position that Suffolk is in in terms of our funding? And as everybody keeps saying, we're chipping away to try and get DfE to recognise. I think it might be um, a changing government that will help us there. Alan, you want to come back? And just to take the opportunity to thank schools for all their efforts with special needs children. I know they are, uh, you know, uh, pulling up trees and in, in, in their, in their efforts to help someone. My thanks to all of you for that. Thank you. Indeed, we'll all endorse that. Thank you. Any other points from anyone? Or do we just feel too deflated to say anything else today about it? I think that's how some of us who've been around this table for many years are feeling about it. Darren. Thank you, Alison. I just wanted to confirm whether the local authority feels it's confident that sufficient funding in the team to manage the volume of EHCs and turn them around within the timescale that's expected, which is clearly a long way short of, of the timescale that's meant to happen. Alan. We've got um, a recovery plan for that. We've got um, another seven EPs, I think, starting in September. We're also um, buying in from private providers. We've got a contract with a company called Liquid Personnel who are providing EHCP advice. The single biggest factor um, between EHC, the stop EHCP has been completed in time uh, is, is, e is EP advice. Um, again, this is very much a national issue where but we, we do have a recovery plan, so that, that will get better. I'll take a while to get better because it will take at least 20 weeks to get better. Um, but we're very pleased to have seven new EPs starting in September. And um, the, I, I know that the, the contract that we fairly recently took out with liquid personnel is actually bringing in advice. I think they're going to do about 40 pieces of advice per, um, per month, um, which will 
make a significant dent in the, in the backlog. The other thing we're doing is um, we're working with uh, the politicians and um, with uh, our finance people to um, get more resource because, as you say, Darren, um, 8,000 CECPs, well, as I said, 8,000 CECPs requires more of a workforce because we're all up people in pharmacy. And, and you think seven will make enough of a dent in it? For the EPs and the advice, yes, but we need to. There's lots of other things we need to do. We need to improve. We need, I, th I think we need more people in family services to do all the processing around it. I think um, there's other things we need as well. So we, we're working up a business case with um, our, our finance people. And the county council have been generous in increasing our funding, uh, our base funding over the last couple of years, um, and of course, um, agreeing a, a very significant capital program, but you know, the, the demand keeps on coming. Thank you. We need to keep on looking at what we, we have in, in terms of resources to make sure that we are compliant and doing and, and able to meet our statutory duties. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Gordon, you're next. Thank you. Yes, not a question this time, just an observation. First of all, um, um, thank you for the deficit management template. Um, I'm still ploughing through it, I have to be honest, but um, uh, but I think it's um, it, it's 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 a really useful document, and thank you for everybody who's been involved in the production of that. Uh, and actually, you know, the ex the executive summary, uh, which shows the you know the the accumulated deficits between now and getting up to 25, 26, does tend to focus the 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 mind um, on the on the problems which which we all collectively have. Indeed, thank you, Gordon. Uh, Daniel, thank you. Yeah, I mean, Alan touched on the role of schools in in this piece, really, and just to emphasise um, that the SEND challenge is a national challenge, but it's all of our challenge as well. And hopefully, although it's very newly formed, um, Suffolk Educational Partnership, which is um, a, a collaboration between the local authority and trusts um, through that and through the SEND task group, we can start to um, play our role in it really. And two of the things that we stand by to help with is to get stakeholder involvement on processes, because we all know that the process side of things is, is very difficult. But also on the ground, one of the things we're really keen to try and do is to make sure all the schools in Suffolk are as inclusive as possible. For example, by in my trust, making sure every school gets the inclusion quality mark, and as part of Suffolk Education Partnership, really advocating and amplifying the LA's intent for that as well by putting on some open events in in the autumn term. So, yeah, just wanted to say that that we're all we're all kind of pulling in the same direction, hopefully. Thank you for that update. That's really useful. Um, just while you're on, Dan, although you've just disappeared, I was yeah, just I going to ask you whether Gemma had followed up with you after the last meeting about the, the paper that you'd mentioned. We weren't sure whether Gemma had spoken to you about that. Yes, I, I, I don't think there has been, no, no. OK, we'll get that followed up separately after this meeting then when she's back. Thank you. OK, Thank you. Alan. Uh, just to make the point, Gordon, I'll appreciate this one. At the moment, the uh, the high needs block deficit is held as a kind of separate deficit inside the county council. Um, so a negative reserve, um, which is a very weird thing to have because reserves should be money you have in the bank, you know, for, for rainy days. It's the opposite of that. At the moment, the DFE are allowing us to continue to do that. But if they made that part of the county council deficit um, and made it part of the local authority deficit across the country, it would actually bankrupt lots of local authorities because the wire deficit is, you know, much higher than we'd like it to be, as Michael uh, has said, um, compared to everybody that's in the safety valve and many other big local authorities, because um, our, our deficit is uh, small. And if we had proper funding, we'd have either a very small or no deficit or Indeed. better services. Thank yeah. you. Any, any other points anybody would like to make on this paper? Andrew. Thanks, Alison. Um, yeah, just referring to the, the template document and the, the high needs trends section that is in there. Um, Daniel is absolutely right. Um, this, we need to keep more um, children in mainstream schools. Uh, it's very positive to see those things that are mentioned in there, the Senko helpline, virtual forums, 
multi-agency consultation appointments with SENCOs. Those are all really key points um, and I would I'll be interested to see how those roll out because they're in very early stages, but they are absolutely what we need to do to keep our children in mainstream schools. Thanks, Andrew. That's helpful to have that feedback. Thanks very much. Final opportunity for anybody who wants to raise anything else on that paper. No, super. OK, thank you. Well, we'll keep plugging away in this space and um, echo everybody else's thanks to those who are working very hard um, across the Suffolk system in this space. Uh, just we'll keep plugging away with central government and hopefully the, the message and the penny will drop eventually. We need more than a penny. Um, OK, moving on. Um, I don't have any, any other business. Uh, nothing has been raised with me. I, just in case anybody wants to raise anything right now, but I don't see any hands up. OK, thank you. So we move on to the forward agenda, paper E, uh, which shows that our next meeting is on the 5th of October. Um, the agenda items there will include uh, approval of the Cent Central School Services block budget for the 24-25 year. And there'll be the feedback from Christina on the outcome of the early years um, grant funding, as well as the outturn for 22-23. Um, and no doubt we will have an update on the high needs block position as well, um, which we typically get at all our meetings. Uh, is there anything else anybody would request that we consider for addition to the agenda for next time? If anybody thinks of anything in the meantime, then um, please get in touch with through Teresa. OK, super. Well, thanks all very much for your time today. Very, um, very good debate about some very difficult topics this morning. Thank you all for your time and commitment that you give to Schools Forum. It's very much appreciated. Hope you have a good rest of your day. See you all soon. Bye.